It is good to be home. <laughs> We're back in the rural rooms. Thank goodness. My name is Joey Manson, and I'm the Center Director at the Seward Park Audubon Center. And I want to welcome you all back to our first event, our first live event back at the rural room, bringing some of our favorite writers, authors, and artists, and putting them in front of the community that we care about and love, and the ones who care about nature and conservation and birds. So um, for tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about something that I think we all know about a little bit, and we want to learn a little bit more. I don't have my clicker, so I'm going to do this by hand. But it's Puget Sound. And you know, the Puget Sound is just a, such a tremendous force in all of our lives, whether we know it or not. This is a place that, uh, that nurtures us. It's a place for commerce. It's a place for recreation. It's a place for us to, to get together and celebrate and marvel over all the beauty and all the, the creatures that live below it. So Audubon is a conservation organization, if you weren't aware of that. And so to talk about what Audubon is doing right now and all the time about Puget Sound, because we're not only about birds, even though birds love water and birds love fish, we are first and foremost a conservation organization. I want to introduce you to Audubon's uh, Washington State Executive Director, Deborah Jensen. Thank you, Joey. It's really a pleasure to be here in person and see some old friends. Um, and I think probably all of us are excited to actually have real life instead of only virtual Zoom reality. I just wanted to say a couple of words. Um, I think many of you know something about Puget Sound and probably heard several years ago about some of the challenges the orca are facing in Puget Sound, one of our charismatic creatures that give us an insight into what's going on in these waters. But one of the things that you saw if you were watching our script as it went by is that Audubon is this group of people who care about nature and care about birds and we're conservationists and we're storytellers and we're advocates. And in the Puget Sound, we've been putting together with the network of Audubonners the data about what's going on for birds in Puget Sound. So we know what are the places in Puget Sound that need to get protected or restored. And we're working with local communities and some of the local tribes on estuary restorations that matter for the birds and the salmon. And then we're working in the legislature to try to get enough funding for habitat protection. And Ed says I need to speak louder. That's not usually a problem I have, um, those of you who've met me before. And so we're working on what do we need to do to protect the important places? How do we get the funding to protect those important places? And then what are some of the policies that we need to change to make the Puget Sound a more functioning ecosystem? And I know you're here to hear David tonight. And so I will get down. But if you want to stay in touch with us about our Puget Sound work, um, you, you know how to find us. And we'll send you little notes about what's going on. And you can learn more. And if you care a lot about it, you could help us advocate to protect Puget Sound. Thanks very much. Thank you, Deborah. And uh, before we get started, I want to acknowledge a couple of our people on staff and our volunteers. You probably saw Ed Dominguez. Many of you know Ed Dominguez as a wonderful naturalist. And yeah, they're already clapping. Uh, <laughs> And, and in many ways, in many ways, the voice of Seward Park Audubon, he's the one that you kind of pay to see. We also have one of our uh, volunteers. We have two of our volunteers. We have Grace over there in the back counter. She's there. She's going to be selling books a little bit later on, so have your uh, credit cards handy. And we also have Armand. Armand is a great volunteer, too, and so both of those people do so much more than help us out on these events. They're out there um, getting sweaty, getting dirty, you know, typing on keyboards and getting things done, so we truly appreciate what they do do. And we truly appreciate the Royal Room for once again welcoming us and uh, making us feel at home with such great food and care. I also want to thank all of you for registering, so it helps us keep this program alive, um, keeps us organized, and many of you made donations during those. Those things are so important and so vital for us, uh, vital for us to keep the programs that you see and that you don't see, it's things like our, um, our veterans program, our school field trips, our teen programs. It keeps those things going, and we truly support, uh, we truly appreciate all the support that you provide to us. Now, we're going to talk about this guy over here just a little bit, uh, Mr. David B. Williams. And and uh, I always think about David B. Williams as kind of that uh, Venn diagram thing. 
So over here you have people and over here you have geology. And here's that intersection that helps us understand, you know, the things that we look at every day and don't really question enough. You know, the things about those major uh, construction projects that have gone on that may not have been so well thought off, but still they help define, you know, what we know as the city of Seattle. Uh, on the way in, many of you were offered a uh, water lines map. Definitely, if you did not get one in, get one going out. David B. Williams was part of putting these together. It's a great, um, it's a great tool in understanding the whys and how uh, the Seattle shorelines. Like, I didn't know that you know, Pioneer Square was built on sawdust, but once they told me why, it made a whole lot of sense. But anyway, uh, grab one of these and grab it out. This person is an outstanding author. Uh, he was, uh, was uh, nominated for a Washington State Book Award for Too High, Too Steep. Too high, too steep. Yeah, and um, he's here to share with you his latest book, which is um, about Puget Sound, the place that we all know and love, the place with 150-year-old clams, the place that has underwater forest. We're talking about the Puget Sound. His book is Home Waters, uh, and he is David B. Williams. Thank you, Joey. It is an honor and pleasure to be here. It is an honor and pleasure to be outside or inside or wherever I am. It's just great to be here. I've, this is, I think, the second in-person event I've done um, in the last four months since the book came out. So uh, thank you all for coming out. Thank you to Joey again. Thank you to Deborah. Thank you to the Royal Room. Thank you to all of you for what you do for the Audubon Center and I'm sure what you do for Puget Sound. And so let me just launch in and see if I can make technology work. Um, there it is. So let me just tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I grew up in the Seattle area. I've lived here for most of my life. And my focus as a writer is connections, as Joey said, between people and place. How are we affected by landscape and how do we affect the landscape around us? How do we make connections? How do we develop a relationship? And that's always my goal as a writer. I hope to share stories that help people better understand the world that's around them and develop that that relationship in a, in a variety of different ways. Um, done it through a variety of different books, and the one tonight, Home Waters in the center here. Um, I, this is, uh, this, it's my favorite book. And people always ask, you know, authors, what's your favorite book? This is my favorite. I think this is my best book, and I'm incredibly, incredibly proud of it. So let me just launch in and, and stop yim yammering about stuff like that. So when I began this book, I spent six months interviewing scientists, historians, tribal members, friends, to try and understand what are the important stories of this place? What are the, the things that you think people need to know? And that was the basis for the book. So I went out and, and I have, I think, seven notebooks from field time with people. So just an incredible experience. But the first question that is off, I was asking is, what is Puget Sound, and the map that you see in front of you is the state bound, the state definition of Puget Sound. It's all the water that flows into the salt water. So from the top of Rainier out to Cape Flattery, up to the Canada border, because the state recognizes that what flows into that water is critical. What we do on land is critical. We are connected. We can never separate ourselves, our actions on the land from what happens to the sound to the species in the sound. For my book purposes, I think of this as greater Puget Sound. And what I'm really interested in is what I call Puget Sound proper, really the area south of Admiralty Inlet. This name, Puget Sound, if you are not don't know, originates in May of 1792, when George Vancouver has sailed into the Strait of Juan de Fuca and becomes the first known European to take a right turn at what we call Port Townsend. He sails down and they anchor their ship just off of Restoration Point, which they name, on Bainbridge Island, which they don't name. And he sends two boats south, two oar boats, one and led by Peter Puget. And they sail there, they paddle around the south end of the sound, exploring, poking around, getting to know the area a little bit better. They end up back at the, at the ship about a week later. And in his journal, George Vancouver writes, to honor his exertions, I name this Puget's Sound. 
and that's the origin of the name. And it really only referred to the area south of Seattle and really just south of Tacoma was the original Puget Sound. All the area north, we think of Admiralty Inlet as just that narrow little passageway. The original Admiralty Inlet extended all the way down to Seattle. So obviously names change. This is the European name, but by far the much longer name, of course, is the Lachutzi term, Hwolge, which I know I mispronounce because I'm horrible with any pronunciation of things, but it means the salt. And it was a word that was less a cartographic term or a geographic term as we think, but more a relationship term. We are of the salt. We are connected to the salt. And they saw themselves, the people who lived along the salt water, as of higher breeding than those who lived on the fresh water. In fact, there was an ethnographer in the area in the early 1900s interviewing a variety of people, and he came across an insult for those people who were of lower breeding. You would say, you are like that person from yonder Issaquah. <laughs> so I did not make that up, and I'm not saying I believe that. I'm just saying that that's what it used to be back in the day, the way back day. But the huolge is still a concept, this idea of the salt. I've been out with people who are fishers, and they will say, oh, yeah, we're going to fish the salt as opposed to the freshwater. So I think it's still a way to think about relationships to place. So in the book, what I do is try to tell the human and the natural history stories of the sound, a variety of different ones. And the first chapter begins as far back as we can go f with archaeological evidence for people in this part of the world. It goes back about 13,000 years to a site in Redmond uh, where there was a tool working site. And so the people came in to work, the, work that site. And they were there for maybe 1,000, 2,000 years. We have evidence for that. And then they, that site gets covered with water. So we assume that they probably went someplace else. We just don't have the evidence of where they went. And so as I trace their, those people, the, the indigenous people, through the thousands of years, I talk about how climate has changed, how the environment changed. Originally, what we think of the sound after the last ice age, you're probably familiar with the formation of the sound. As Joey said, I think about the world through geology. So even if I wasn't talking about geology, I would connect it. So we need to understand that 16, 17,000 years ago, a sheet of ice plows south out of Canada goes between the Olympic and the Cascade Mountains, extends about as far south as Olympia, then retreats or melts back to the north. Water flowing underneath that ice sheet, which in Seattle, 3,000 feet thick, so roughly five space needles. Water flowing underneath that carves out Puget Sound. Puget Sound's not carved by ice, it's carved by water. And the water, then eventually that ice retreats. It retreats far enough back to allow salt water to return, to come back in. So Puget Sound itself, the modern Puget Sound, from a geologic point of view, only about 15, 16,000 years old. So I look at this early evidence for people coming into this savanna-like environment, and then over time, the, their world changes, they adapt. And then I move into looking at other people who are coming into this area. And one thing that really struck me is we always hear the story about George Vancouver and maybe the Hudson's Bay Company and the Wilkes Expedition of 1841, which is the first from the United States. But the Spanish were actually the first people in this part, first Europeans in this part of the world. And it really struck me as we look up the number of names on the land that are of Spanish origin, the San Juan Islands, Lopez, Fidalgo, Harrow, Harrow Strait, those are all Spanish. So we have these connections. So I wanted to explore how did people live in this landscape? How did they leave behind names that help us understand their relationships to place? Then I look at defending Puget Sound. How did people protect the place they love, which we are still trying to do to this day in obviously a much different guise? It grew out of my interest in the forts at the North End, Flagler, Casey, and Warden. What's the story with those places? They're really weird. But if you go back and look at native people, the indigenous people, they of course were interested in protecting this place. And so trying to understand those stories of how do you defend a place you love and what does it mean to defend and protect a landscape that you care about. So those are the human history chapters. There's one more that I'll come back to more in depth in just a minute. Then I turn to natural history. 
and look at a variety of species that I think are essential to the sound but are often overlooked in the sound. We, of course, know the stories of the charismatic, the, the icons, the salmon and the orca. But what about the herring? They have been described to me, they were described to me as the hub to which the sound revolves around from an ecological point of view. Because they are incredibly prolific, they are what are known as forage fish along with um, surf smelt and sand lance. And they are the hub in the sense that they eat lots of smaller things, as I heard it described, they convert crunchy things to nutrients for bigger animals. And so then the bigger animals eat them. And without Herring, we do not have orca, is the way it was phrased. So I explore that human history. Interestingly enough, we think of salmon as the essential animal of the, 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 the Coast Salish people. Looking in the archaeological record, herring are just, if not more ubiquitous, and just as abundant. So there's this incredible relationship between the people of this area, the native people, and herring. And then it becomes also very important when after European settlement. And then there's rockfish. Uh, rockfish are, I knew nothing about rockfish. They are one of the most amazing groups. There are 27 species in the genus Sebastes, meaning magnificent. And they are magnificent animals. They are beautiful, colorful. They range in size from about yay big to about yay big. They are one of these animals that they could have been here when Wilkes came here in 1841. They, there are a couple species who lived for well over 100 years. The oldest known rockfish was 205 years old. It was actually caught in Alaska. But we have the species, and this image over on your right is an otolith, or an ear bone. And with rockfish and many and uh, all fish, they, they put down a little layer each year on their this ear bone. It's a very tiny ear bone. You can see the little two millimeter sign. And so, if you have someone who is incredibly dedicated, and I might say anal, to count 205 layers on something that's maybe three or four. It's a lot harder to do that than on a tree. Uh, but they also exemplify a, a really critical story in the sound, and that is the relationship between management and how we, and biology. We did not understand the biology of rockfish when there was a huge promotion in the 1970s to fish them and those populations have been decimated and they are now at the point where two of those species are on the federal list of endangered species and there are now management plans. In fact, I was talking to the person managing the plan yesterday and he said, what's incredible is we're still learning about these fish. We're still acquiring knowledge that helps us understand them. And that to me is a central story and a central theme for me about this book, and one of my goals in writing this book was to offer hope and provide hope, because I do feel it. I did, it grew in me as I wrote this book, and one reason was because of the scientists who were obtaining better knowledge and helping us to understand this place better, and with that knowledge, we are much better, we are becoming better able to manage these species. I'm not saying it's perfect, but they are doing some amazing things and learning amazing things. Then, there's my favorite picture in the entire book. Um, it's not the one on the right because I couldn't get permission to use it, but um, if you know these two guys, they are happy fellows because they've got this gooey duck in their hand. I love the look on their face. So I have a chapter devoted to Olympia oyster and gooey duck, and those two animals uh, really represent another story in the sound to me. Olympia oyster, our native oyster, if you've eaten oysters, you've most likely not eaten Olympia oysters. You've eaten Pacific, the big ones. Those are not native. They were introduced in the 1920s. The o Olympias, the sort of 50 cent piece one, have really suffered. Um, they were actually our first big fishery in the sound, um, much more valuable than salmon early on. And then there's gooey ducks. And right now, the Olympia oyster population is very low, and the gooey, popu gooey duck population is vast. Probably more gooey duck in Puget Sound than any other animal, of a large animal. And 
It's pretty incredible. So you, the term gooey duck, it's one of the few terms that we have in Lachutzi that still re that's represents that, that native name. It means dig deep. If you've ever tried to obtain a gooey duck, you know how challenging it is. It's really hard to dig deep to get them. But most of the gooey duck that's harvested, or a huge chunk of it, comes from between about 18 and 70 feet deep in Puget Sound. In the 1960s, divers working for the Navy made this discovery that gooey duck lived as a subtitle organism. We thought they they're only in the intertidal zone, and now we realize they're down. They go down as deep as 300 feet in the sound, hundreds of millions of them there. And what they represent for me is Olympia Oyster represents the early story, I think, of Puget Sound. People come in, European settlers come in, and they see this as a place to exploit, to get, grab whatever they can, coal, trees, salmon, Olympia Oysters, no control over it. And we can't criticize them. They couldn't imagine the vat, the bounty of this place was incredible, and yet we obviously have created many issues. Gooey duck, on the other hand, are very heavily managed. We, we harvest them with, in a sustainable manner, and that to me is a, real, a big story of the sound, and again, a story that gives me hope that what had been exploitation, a view for many of the residents, has now changed over to what I really think of as a viewpoint of the sound of sustainability, of stewardship. How can I, as an individual, make this a better place, this incredibly beautiful, incredibly diverse landscape here. And that, to me, gooey duck really exemplify part of that. Plus, they're just totally cool. If you've ever, my wife always looks at me strange when I do this. If you've ever seen a baby gooey duck, oh my God, they are the cutest <laughs> little animal. Because you know when they're big, you get these two guys in uh, astonishment um, at their sort of, you, well, we don't, we don't want to go into the anatomy. Um, but the babies look just the same, but they're the size of, like, of uh, a pinto bean, and they have a little neck, and it goes wiggle, wiggle. Really, if you ever have a chance, seek them out. Really, really cute. And then, obviously, the icon, Salmon and Orca. The book ends with them. And what I wanted to look at them, look at the, their lives. I wanted to look at their life histories because to me one of the aspects of, of these of both these group these groups, the five species of salmon and really the two they're not species, but the two different groups of orcas. We have the southern residents, which are really struggling, and we have the bigs, formerly known as the transient, the mammal eaters that are doing quite well. But each of those groups, the salmon and the orca, superbly adapted. Each moved back into this area after the water, after this becomes salt water, and over that 15,000 year history, they have evolved together. They've evolved as a relationship to place. Think of a salmon, they are the homebodies. They go back to that same river every, when you know, they're drawn back. Orca are too, they're also homebodies. They're drawn back to the sound. They come to, to at the right time of year. So it's that relationship between these animals and place is one that we can benefit from because to me, the DNA of this place runs in their veins and it runs in the veins of many animals and that has given them a resiliency. Think of the Elwha Dam. The Elwha Dam comes down and immediately after salmon return and as a biologist said to me they returned because they've done it before they've been doing this for thousands of years they have been adapting they have been fighting they have been they've been moving back into landscape that has gone through change over time there's a resiliency built in through that DNA what we need to do and I think we are working on that, is give these animals the opportunity to, ex to uh, show that resiliency. And we see it in so many different ways. So now I'm going to do a total switch, and I'm going to talk about one, of my, one, chapter, one of the chapters on human history. And this is what I call the Maritime Highway, looking at how did the sound... How is it used as a highway? And this image, uh, this uh, Alfred Bierstadt image, with uh, the, is to me exemplifies a central story of the sound. He recognized the beauty of the mountains. He recognized the beauty of the water. He recognized the beauty of the forest. But he put that canoe in there because the canoe was central to the story of the sound. Probably for at least the last 5,000 years, even though we have a much deeper record, we know that cedar, the, the tree of canoes, did not come into this area, become the dominant tree until about 5,000 years ago. And we have no 
old records of any of these, any, bo any, any boats. But we know for at least the last 5,000 years, canoes were the, the means of creating community in the sound. They allowed people to go anywhere in the sound and connect up, move goods, move people, relationships between families. Um, that was central to the story. And those canoes that evolved here were superbly adapted. Out more sort of up on the coast and up in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, you would see more of the war canoes, these massive canoes able to be out in this big body of water, big waves, big weather out there. But in the sound, think about the sound. The sound is a relatively benign environment for moving through by boat. We don't have all those horrible things. We don't have hurricanes. We don't have nor'easters. We don't have, it doesn't, except for June, it didn't normally doesn't get terribly hot here. Um, it doesn't get terribly cold. We don't have bugs. There's aren't, there's no one's gonna really, big animals gonna eat you. It's a relatively benign environment. We do have, of course, the big problems of tidal change. Uh, we have, that is incredibly challenging, and we do have that sort of salmon chowder fog that we all love in the winter. So it did take talent and it did take skill, but it was very different, and so it was a great body of water just to move across. And the dominant canoes in this area were two, the freight canoe and the trolling canoe. The freight, as it implies, was one for moving goods through the area, the trolling for out hunting. Uh, curiously, those Issaquans, or Issaquanians, or Issaquites, I don't know what an Issaquan it's a, pers it's, a, it's a person is called. Um, they used a shovel nose canoe, and so the canoes on the fresh water were different than the saltwater canoes. They were adapted and evolved very differently. So this was the culture for 5,000 years, and fortunately, we've seen a big revival over the last few years. If you've been involved or noticed the canoe journeys, where indigenous people, First Nations people are coming um, and, and really regrowing that culture. And I've talked to people about that, and I particularly remember talking to um, a member of the Muckleshoot tribe, and he said, yeah, this was amazing. I've, I've, it reconnected me with my family. It reconnected me with place. I had to understand tides. I had to understand weather patterns. And that, to me, was just a really wonderful way to, to think about that deep, deep relationship that's really shown in the canoes. But then in 1835, things begin to change. When this ship is built on the Thames River in London, and it was known as the Beaver. And the Beaver was owned by the Hudson's Bay Company. They were uh, based down at Fort Vancouver, and, and they also had a fort, uh, Fort Nisqually down in the South Sound area. And they build this ship as a steamer, steamship, a paddle wheeler. But to get it here, they outfit it as a sailing ship, sail it down, around, across to Hawaii, to Fort Vancouver, convert it back to a paddle wheeler. And in 1835, it becomes the first steamer in Puget Sound. 16 years before those Denny people arrive here, we had steamships in this, this area. And it really becomes the floating general store. They use it to move goods, to move people, to extend community up and down the Sound. With that ship, we really open up that opportunity of having a different means of travel. There was just one problem with it, that it was British. And in 1846, uh, Washington becomes part of the United States, and the American citizens were rather annoyed that the British had the only steamship. So they were thrilled when this little boat here, the ferry, arrives. And the ferry arrives not under its own power. It's small enough that it arrives on um, another ship called the Sarah, uh, another clipper called the Sarah Warren. But when it gets here, everyone's happy because it, several things. One is it will be used to transport people from down in Olympia up to Stillicum and to in 1853, when Seattle and Alki, or Alki as the newcomers call it, uh, were two separate towns. Five dollars to go from Olympia to Stillicum, ten dollars to go north. This is a time when people made two to three dollars a day, and they were incredibly excited about this boat. Unfortunately, it was described, well, not unfortunately, it was described as undersized and cranky. Um, probably could describe a few people we know. Um, but it sank. But it still shows the way. It sank after only two years. But within just a handful of years, we get the development of what's known, I'm sure you've heard of it, the Mosquito Fleet, this vast armada of steamships that plied Puget Sound. And they come in all shapes and sizes. 
Um, the smallest that I came across was the 19-foot-long Polky. The, the biggest was the 293-foot Yosemite over there. And it was one of these vessels where they didn't really fit exactly into any description, but I always liked the, the way that uh, Justice Potter Stewart described pornography. You knew it when you see it. You knew, a, you knew one of these when you saw one. They were generally pointy-ended, flat-bottomed, made of wood, steam-powered, and propeller-driven, but Almost all of them were individually owned by people who had more or less nautical ability and knowledge and care. But they, again, they were that sinew that wove together Puget Sound because it allowed people to live anywhere, anywhere in Puget Sound on the water, and you could get a, a, one of these boats would go by. Here is the, the main routes were initially north-south, Olympia up to Seattle or, or further north, but as Seattle and Tacoma grow, and particularly as the railroad comes in, this becomes an east-west network, and just going everywhere, up rivers, um, all along the sound, and this is a list of places it, the Mosquito Fleet went, more than 350. And if by the end of the talk anyone can name 150 of them, um, I'm going to be really proud of you, while, since the slide's not going to be up terribly long, but you're, you all are good, I bet. But Think about how many places the modern ferry system goes, maybe 25, 30. All you had to do was live somewhere and that along the water. And you could even just row out your boat when, a, when one of the, the, these boats was going by. And I'm sure you've been walking around the sound and seen piling sticking up going out, in the, out into the water. And you're like, God, what is that? What, what was there? Good chance it was a Mosquito Fleet dock. It was a landing. Um, and so these were everywhere. And I, to me, this, again, I keep coming back to this. This is about community. It's about knitting together this area through the waterway as a means of travel. Unfortunately, the Mosquito Fleet is no longer, but there are two Mosquito Fleet vessels left in the Sound. There's the Virginia Five, which is the younger of the ones. It was built in 1922. Um, it was saved in the 1960s by a group of uh, steamer aficionados. It's now in the National Register of Historic Places. If you've never been, it is a, on it. it is a beautiful boat. It's anchored near Mohai in Lake Union. Again, that classic pointy-ended, flat-bottom wood, steam-powered, propeller-driven. Beautiful, beautiful. If we ever have a chance to ride it, it often, they, do the, they often take it out uh, on public adventures, so I really encourage you. But... My favorite is the 1918 Carlisle II. It runs, uh, still runs, and it's one that you can get on much more easily. There's some debate. Some people say, well, it's diesel driven, so it's not. Well, I say to you, because this has been running basically the same route for almost its entire existence, from Bremerton across the Port Orchard. And you can ride it for, I think it's two bucks. Um, get your Orca card. Uh, it's a really handsome little boat. What beautiful wood on the inside. And those of you who grew up here remember the, um, the pay things you did when you rode metro buses, those really ornate sort of metal things. Those are still on that, at least the last time I rode it. But also, when I've ridden it, what stands out for me is it is still a community builder because many of the people who, were, who I saw on it were working in Bremerton. At the end of the day, they were taking this boat across the Port Orchard. They didn't have to drive around. They could have, but they could just take the boat across. They knew it was always going to be there. They had friends on it. At the end of the day, they could relax a little bit. It was about and is about community, this vessel. Then, in then we have the change. As the automobile comes in, we have the change from the, the uh, Mosquito Fleet really to the ferry system. And probably the most famous, of course, is the Black Ball Line ferry owned by uh, the P Puget Sound Navigation Company. It starts to take over. We have a fundamental change going from a system of individual owners to corporate ownership. And some people were happy by that, and some people were upset about that. And then in 1950, the state takes over the ferry system. They buy out the black ball line and eventually then take over that system. And one of the highlights for me, and one thing I tried to do on this, on this working on this book, is I tried to ride every ferry in Puget Sound. And most of us are familiar with the wash dot ferries that carry something like 90% of them. But there are uh, many, many 
more ferries in, Sa in the Sound. And I define the ferry as a regularly scheduled service for passengers. So you've got, as you can see, you've got the, the, the Kitsap County one, the Bremerton to Orchard one, number 12. That's the one that the Carlisle 2 runs on. Pierce County has one. Make sure you get on the one that goes to Ketron and not the one that goes to, um, what's the other island where the prisons? <laughs> McNeil, don't get on that one. Um, <laughs> Whatcom. And Skagit, the Lummi and the Guamus Island ferries, really cute little ferries. If you get the, the times I've ridden the Lummi Island ferry, they don't, you just get on the boat and then they take your money as a, the person walks around and goes door to door and passenger to passenger. I think that's quite charming. King County's got its new, the, the water taxis, a couple more. Then there are the private ones. And these are ones owned by home, homeowners associations. And this was the one ferry I couldn't ride. I asked the Decatur Island Homeowners Association if I could ride their ferry. I just wanted to ride the ferry. Go on. I wasn't going to get off the island and come back. They said, no, you cannot come on our ferry. So I asked the Gedney Hat Island people, and they're like, fine, you can come on our ferry, but you can't get off our ferry on our island. So I didn't. Finally, the Heron Island Ferry, they let me off the ferry. They let me on the island, and they let me back on the ferry. So that was really key. It's also the, the most unusual vehicle I've ever seen driven on. When I was waiting in the parking lot for the Heron Island Ferry, this truck comes up, unloads three or four John Deere riding mowers. Ferry comes in, people get off. I've never seen people ride a John Deere riding mower onto a ferry. It was pretty cool. <laughs> and then, of course, there's the Jetty Island, the little cute one down there. But the highlight for me of all of this was the day I spent with uh, Captain Marsha Morse of the Washdot Ferries. She's worked basically everything you can do. And we uh, went back and forth a couple of times just chatting about it. She would leave when she had to really do, do anything. But we had, in our discussion, she made a really profound statement that that's stands with me. She said, I grew up in Eastern Washington. And the big vistas in Eastern Washington, there was a spiritualness to this. And she said, when I'm on a ferry, that's one of the places you have those big views. We've all hiked in the mount, hiked here, and we get in the forest. We can't see as well. But out on, the, out on the ferries, we have this big openness. There's a spirituality. And I thought, to me, that was just a beautiful way to express what I feel is central to this waterway and the, and the water and the traffic on it, the boats on it, is there is a very uh, utilitarian matter that allows community to build, but there's also a spiritual aspect. And we are incredibly blessed that we can still take advantage of it. We can get on these ferries and have that connection to place. I'm sure you all have been on one and encountered something, an animal, a view, a connection, a breeze, or whatever it is. And so, to me, a central part of understanding the sound is to understand that story. Now we'll do another switch to uh, a plant, uh, kelp. And I was one of those people, uh, up until about three years ago, when I had pizza with a man named Tom Mumford, who I saw kelp as that sort of you know, stinky, spinachy, gross stuff on the beach, like this sort of image here. But in a couple hour discussion, Tom convinced me that kelp are totally cool and essential to understanding the sound. Uh, and one aspect of it is the diversity. We have something like 18 or 20 different species of kelp in the sound, from, from the, the high, the big tall ones, the overstory ones, to the understory, because it is a forest. And I'll come back to that in a second. That forest that grows out there, most of the species are annual, so they're return, renewing that forest every single year. But that human connection also is incredible. And arguably, uh, according to one of the ethnobotanists I talked to, the longest connection we have to any species or any group of species is, in Puget Sound is that connection to kelp. Uh, you're probably familiar with the idea that people came into what's called North America, the New World, if you will, through, some people argue, through this ice-free ice corridor up over it through Canada. But now what's gaining traction is what's known as the kelp highway, that people traveled along the shoreline there. And it makes sense because it's really darn cold in the middle of the continent, particularly in the middle of an ice age, and you're just eking between these massive sheets. But along the water, it's not going to be as bad. There's an amazing 
array of life from microscopic all the way up to animals that, you know, six, eight, mammals six, eight, ten feet across. Um, so you could always find food there. Um, the, the way the forest grew, it attenuates the waves in uh, along the shoreline so it was going to be a little bit safer. At night, if you didn't want to go on shore, you just tie up to a piece of kelp and you wouldn't go anywhere. So this idea is that the kelp highway, people start coming down the kelp highway and one of the off ramps of the kelp highway is Puget Sound. Is that how our friends arrived 12 and a half thousand, 13,000 years ago? We don't know, but this idea is gaining traction that there is a kelp highway. So a deep, deep relationship. Um, and it's, it continues and continued. Kelp was essential and it, uh, to the native people, still is very important to the indigenous people, um, used for all sorts of different um, items. You would sometimes, people paddling their canoes would put kelp on the, on the sides to when they put their paddles down. It wasn't as noisy. You'd use it for flavoring. Um, this shows a wonderful use. If you're familiar with the bull kelp, the, the one that looks like a big t turkey baster on steroids. And they would cut off that end and put wood in it, steam it, and the wood then would become pliable that could then be bent to make a halibut hook. Uh, they would also clean out those bulb ends and use it for either storing water or ulicon oil. Um, and some people think the, the name of Oregon comes from this, uli a, a corruption of ulicon for this fish and the oil there, but also for ropes, all sorts of things. So again, that that intrinsic relationship between people and place, the species that has grown over the thousands of years. Uh, a few people, European settlers, tried to make money off it. Um, they tried to mine it during World War II for potash, which is uh, used in fertilizer. They were not successful. And then the two gentlemen in the middle tried to basically invent something called Citron, which would have replaced citron, which is a, a sort of a, a little fruit thing that you find in uh, fruit cakes. So uh, apparently, as, as I just, I liked, I wrote in the book, apparently people didn't need a new substitute for a fruit cake uh, filler. <laughs> so they didn't, they didn't succeed. Uh, but what it was also used for, and again, I, lo I love this aspect, and again, I'm always interested in those connections. This is a coast and geodetic survey map of, of the sound, and as we zoom in on Ket Anderson Isle, or excuse me, Ketron Island down at the south end, the squiggles are kelp. And these early coast geodetic maps all have squiggles on them in the sound showing where kelp is because kelp was a warning that for shallow water. Darwin writes about the importance of kelp uh, as a navigation aid. So this, this, this relationship is just long going with them, with these plants. Technically they're not plants, but that's a whole nother story. Um, so the kelp forest, arguably as important to the marine ecosystem as the terrestrial, as the temperate rainforest is to the terrestrial ecosystem. Equally complex, an, an understory and an overstory, a place that provides a nursery, a place that provides safe habitat, a place for animals, again, of all different sizes and shapes and styles to grow. They are just lovely. This is, um, this is the person who convinced me, Tom Mumford. If you've seen bull kelp, this is the reproductive patch, that little darker spot. And then there's what's known as the holdfast. And I'm sure you've seen holdfast. They look like a root, and a kelp does look like a plant in the sense that it looks like it has a root and then a long stem and then the, the top. They're very different. These just hold them in place. But a, again, a little microhabitat, um, except for some of the species have much bigger holdfasts and a much bigger habitat. Um, but all sorts of animals, whether it's urchins, sea stars, uh, crabs, abalone, orcas seem to like to wrap their, themselves in kelp. No one knows why. Um, but, you know, orcas have uh, like the one of the biggest brains on earth, so they must know what they're doing. Um, and then also all sorts of little forage fish in their herring are found in there. And one of the issues with kelp is that, again, connections. Uh, that we eliminated the, the otter population, eliminating the otter population allowed the urchin population to explode because otters love urchins. With the explosion of the urchin population, they basically deforest the kelp forests, and you can have these, these urchin barrens because there's so many. Now that the otters are returning, we're seeing this change back um, from, to a more healthy ecosystem in many places. Just a beautiful, beautiful area to, to be down in. And one of the other aspects of it, and again, it gets back to 
why there, for me, an aspect of hope is there are groups that are working to restore the kelp populations. Puget Sound Restoration Fund out on Bainbridge is working throughout the Sound. They're working with Olympia oysters is one of the other species they've been working on. I was lucky enough to go out in the field. But they're also working at trying to understand kelp and that relationship between kelp um, and place and, and, and trying to find ways to restore it, trying to find ways to use it to maybe ameliorate some of the effects of um, ocean acidification because Kelp takes in so much carbon. It's this incredible uh, store. And if you think of this idea that salmon are an animal when they die and they get eaten and excreted out into the forest, you've probably heard this idea that trees grow on salmon. Well, basically, many, many species in the marine environment rely on kelp. Um, so an incredibly important species. And I want to end, again, by thinking about hope on this. And there are a variety of ways to think about it. I've expressed a couple of them. We, in, in the Puget Sound, it's arguably in better shape than it has been for, for many, many years, um, in part because of that change in mentality. We have better regulation. We're not harvesting things as, as, poor, as poorly or badly, however you want to phrase it, um, as we used to. And we see that sustainability. And I've been talking to a variety of people about climate change and thinking about place and connection. And I'll leave you with sort of two thoughts about that. And again, where hope comes from for me. I was talking to a woman who works in climate change regularly and she said, friends tell me, I say, are you pessimistic? She said, no, because I'm working with people who are working to solve the problem. And thinking about what can we do as an individuals be out with people who are working to solve the problem and support them. Seattle Audubon, be out in the field, explore, get to know an area. And another person said to me, or I was listening to her talk, and she said, you know, people always say that nothing I do makes a difference. Because if you compare it to the corporate world, the government world, that's where big change is going to come. But she said, you know, I've turned that around. And I now say everything I do makes a difference. A difference, And I thought it was a beautiful way to express it, that I am part of the story. I am connected to this place. I'm going to work to make it better. I'm going to make mistakes. We're not going to get it back to what it was, but I'm going to think in my world that that's the way to do it. I'm going to be inspired by people who are doing good. I'm going to be inspired by the animals with this incredible life history. All of that, and that gives me hope. And I think that is a powerful tool, and I really encourage you to see the world through those connections, develop those connections to this amazing, amazingly special place. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, this is really more of a stage than a catwalk. But I, I encourage David to step forward and allow everyone to see what he is festooned with. He, he's, he's, got, he's got this map of Puget Sound, is it, or Seattle? There you go. Okay. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> Accessorizing, okay. <laughs> Indeed, all right. <laughs> Definitely wonderful words about hope. I know, um, you know, uh, Linda Mapes, who wrote about the uh, removal of the Elwha dams, talked about how quickly it recovered or it continues to recover because they made those changes there. They removed the dam and things were moving faster than anyone could imagine. So nature, nature responds when given the opportunity. So at this point, um, I'd like to open this up for questions. If anyone has a question for David, um, fashion-wise or otherwise, uh, by all means, um, David, do you, know, you want to? That. My wife made the vest, in case you were wondering. Yes, question. Oh, it's oh yeah. Didn't know that kelp wasn't a plant. It's in a it's in a different group. Uh, it's in a different kingdom, and I can't tell you off the top of my head. It's in the book, but it's they reclassified it, and it's not a plant. It's. I forget what it. It's like more closely related to like mildew must or. I mean, I. It's in the book. That's why I write books, because I can't remember much of anything. But sorry, yeah. Yes? 
It, Puget Sound isn't really a sound, is that the question? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. A sound doesn't really have a definition that I've come across. Um, it, it's from a, um, a Nordic term and an English term that sort of means a, a body of water. And I think where, when I look, was trying to track this down, it was something that really interested me. It's like, why is it called Puget Sound and not Puget Bay or Puget Inlet? Um, and it really, I think, has to do with the fact that Vancouver traveled with initially with James Cook, and Cook seemed to really like using the term sound to name things. And I think it really comes down to that it's just, uh, it just was the popularity for them. It, it really is a British term, and you don't see it in many other places. What's odd about Puget Sound is that it's not named for royalty. All the, so many others, you know, Queen Mary's, King Ding Dong's, I mean, all sorts of, you probably don't know that sound. It's little known, it's little known, so. Yeah, other, other question. Yes. What do gooey ducks taste like? It's in, I did a lot of asking of people who raise gooey ducks and how they like them. Um, you know, they get steamed, they get barbecued. I think they're one of those clams that is gets it has a much more meaty taste. Um, incredibly popular. The I went out with gooey duck uh, divers. As I said, much of it comes from deep from deeper water. Went out with uh, members of the Suquamish tribe, and they would go down harvest the gooey duck, bring them up to the surface, put them in a plastic bag, in a styrofoam box, in a cardboard box, put it on a plane, and it would be in China the next day. Something like 98% of the gooey duck that is harvested in Puget Sound ends up in Asia at this point. Um, and going for well, you know, hundreds of, well over $100 a pound. So it's a very, it's a very dense taste. Yeah, question in the very back. I don't know if it's texture or more shape. Uh, was a big part of it. That was the initial attraction was shape. If you've ever read Craig Welsh's book, um, his name's escaping me, about the whole gooey duck poaching, he goes really, has some interesting observations about that. But yeah, texture is certainly a big part of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. What's going on with gooey duck farming? I went out, uh, what, explored, or spent time with gooey duck farmers. And uh, the one I ex spent time with uh, was very passionate about protecting this place. And I think, you know, they've done studies on the gooey duck farms. If you're not familiar with those, just a second, I'm put this down. They're the areas you've seen perhaps an intertidal zone where there, there'll be a bunch of PVC pipe stuck in the ground and what they do is they embed the, the PVC pipe in the ground. They then put two those totally cute baby gooey duck in there and then within about eight years they're ready to harvest. So they, they put the, they put the uh, tube in, usually a cap on it because people, uh, people, animals like to eat those little cute, I know it's shocking, I shouldn't say this, but animals do like to eat those really cute babies. So they have a cover on them until about two years and then by that point the animal's big enough that no one will, will do anything and, and they bury themselves deeply enough, they pull the tubes out. And they've done studies that show limited effect from an ecological effect from those, um, the, from the gooey duck farms in the sound, from what I've gathered from talking to, say, University of Washington biologists who've done studies down there. And they're comparing different things. They also make the point that the intertidal zone is already a zone of incredible change. And so animals are able to adapt to that change over time. And again, the people who I talked with, again, they were incredibly passionate about protecting this place and thinking about it as a work, balancing that working sound with uh, people who are living, ar living around it. It's obviously a very complex issue, but I, I felt, at least from who I talked to, that they made gar good arguments in, in for me, so. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious with the impact of so many people in recent years have become somewhat dull. Are you finding that, that there is an appetite to learn about the history of this place? 
Yeah, so he uh, basically, is there an appetite to learn about the history of this place? Yes. I mean, I lead tours, I give talks, and yeah, I just think there's an incredible appetite. I was lucky enough to give a talk um, earlier this year, was reached out to from uh, Google and gave a talk to uh, their managers, and they bought uh, 250 copies of my Walks book and 250 copies of my Too High and Too Steep to give to employees. And that's been one of my goals, is how do I reach out to those, those people? And I think, it's, I think they're slowly developing that thirst. And it's, it's an interesting observation, too, if you think about people who, again, early settlers, and for many years, people who lived in the Sound worked the Sound. And most people don't work the sound. They have a very different relationship to the sound. And when one of the biologists I talked to and, and, and thinking about aquaculture and the gooey duck harvest, he said people are really comfortable with land-based agriculture, but less comfortable with aquaculture because they don't have that as much of a relationship. And studies, again, that have been done show that generally aquaculture is much less damaging. Obviously, it depends on what type of aquaculture compared with, say, your regular cow being, har being um, raised on land. So, it, yeah, I do think it in a one word, yes. So, and I'm trying to do it. I'm trying to reach out to them. It's, it's definitely a goal. Yeah. Yeah. What's up? What's up with with sea level rise? Yeah. I mean, we definitely have issues. What's interesting about the sound is it depends on where you are in the sound. The South Sound and the North Sound are very different because the South Sound or the North Sound is still experiencing some land rise from glacial rebound. So when that ice was here, you have a three thousand foot thick sheet of ice. The land gets pressed down, like if you push your hand down into, say, a cake. And it, well, I don't know if cake ever bounces back. Um, that's a bad one. Well, if you can imagine, just pretend. Oh, you put something in a bathtub. How about that? You got your rubber ducky. You push it down in, it pops back up. Land does that after the ice goes. And if you go out to some place like Cape Flattery, Cape Flattery is not experiencing sea level rise. It's experiencing land rise. It's still rising out of the water. South Sound is, is much less of that. So South Sound is experiencing sea level rise relatively more than the North Sound because of the geologic conditions. And so, yeah, we are getting it. But someone made a really interesting point to me the other day. I'd never thought of this. I was uh, a salmon biologist. He said, one way we may be able to take advantage of, of sea level rise is in areas of deltas in Puget Sound. And his example was the Snohomish River. That area has been very diked over, and that land had, had historically been used for agriculture, and much of it's not used for that anymore. But as sea level rise comes up, that land is now has the potential to be flooded and be converted from agricultural land to habitat for salmon, tidal freshwater habitat. So they're I'm not saying that I'm an advocate for sea level rise, but there may be ways that we can think about it that is takes that uses it to benefit and not all for bad. Other questions? Yes, in the back. So many of you said about my product that it was introduced to this way of town for two and a half years before then and two years later for three and a half years. So yeah, yeah, good question. So uh, this is from my book, Too High and Too Steep, where I uh, talk about the sawdust, the area down um, around, uh, say, um, Occidental Park. Much of that area was, some of it was built on sawdust, and all of the area were the, what I still call the kingdoms. In fact, I have a kingdom pin on. Um, I went opening day, my birthday, when the, you know, oh yeah, thank you, it's beautiful. Um, but the two stadiums, the, I don't know what they're called, the kingdoms. It's simpler to call them just the kingdoms because I like the kingdoms still. Uh, they are actually, when they were built, we were pretty lucky in the sense that they were built after we understood the geology of this area. If, you had if the stadiums had been built 40 years ago, say when the kingdom was built, we didn't understand the geologic issues in the sound. We didn't understand that there was this big Cascadia subduction zone out on the coast. If you read the New, York, New Yorker article, she said the coast is toast or Seattle's toast or something like that. Um, when that goes, it's going to be ugly. But then there's also this big fault zone that runs east-west east, basically I-90 from Issaquah through. Um, when that goes, the last time it went 1,100 years ago, there was 20 feet of offset. 
those are going to be big ones and we're going to suffer. But the two stadiums were built with that knowledge and the engineering is much more advanced. Uh, they're, the stadiums, for instance, the uh, baseball stadium that ha is two parts, it, they move independently and the, uh, the other one is, um, has a, also has an ability to move a bit. So if you're going to be in a building um, and you want to be there at a time when, say, the team is losing, which happens every once in a while, um, but you want to be safe go to those two buildings, are actually two of the safer buildings, even though they're the, area, the older buildings around them will definitely suffer as that, that fill down there um, has the potential to liquefy or turn to jello. So the stadiums are actually in pretty good shape. The, what's inside them isn't, but the, the stadiums themselves, so. Yeah. Oh yeah, so the, the difference between P Puget Sound and Salish Sea. So 20, 25 years ago, there was this idea of the Salish S Sea, that the Strait of Georgia running along the east side of Vancouver Island, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and Puget Sound were all part of one body of water, or are all part of one body of water. And that's really has come to to be, and, it, and it's a great way to, to describe that ecosystem, that it, there, is no, there are no borders, that 49th parallel is irrelevant, um, that water moves through them, animals move through them, people have been moving through them for thousands of years. So Salish Sea is very much an accepted term. I purposely chose not to focus on that because I wanted to focus on the sound, the area really south of Admiralty Inlet, and tell those stories. The stories I tell, you could tell very similar ones up in the Strait of Juan de Fuca and very similar ones up along the um, Strait of Georgia. It's just that Salish Sea really recognizes and acknowledges a connection between life histories of the animals, life histories of the people, and place. And I, I think it's a great term. I just chose not to focus on it in the book from really a, just a technical point of view, if you will. And I've got one more question for for Joy gives me, pulls me off. Yes. Yeah, so the question about uh, the sea stars and otters. Um, sea stars are also a big eaters and controllers of urchins. There was a, a sort of a, a very, very famous ex um, study done by a man named Bob Payne out on the coast where he pried up all of the uh, sea stars in an area, threw them back into the water, and watched what happened to all the invertebrates were there. And it had been incredibly diverse uh, prior to the removal of the sea stars, and once the sea stars were removed, we saw the population basically coalesce into one species, one or two species. So having that pre keystone predator is incredibly important. As you're probably well aware, over the last handful of years, particularly a while, uh, say, seven, eight, ten years ago, more, more, a little bit more recently than that, we had this sea star wasting disease and we lost many of the sea stars. But we are now also seeing some recovery of sea stars um, in areas. So we, the, things do seem to be coming back a little bit better. And that's great because when you have a top predator, when you have a keystone species, when you have an orca, when you have a salmon, when you have a sea star, when you have an otter, they help control the population and allow that population to be much more naturally distributed across this area. So I, again, I, th I think we are seeing some improvement. But there are obviously all these things, they're challenges. Um, that everything we're facing in the sound. But ultimately, I'll leave you with this final thing. I still really, really believe and have hope um, in this. And I think that hope lies in all of us, it has that the potential. And that's that, that to me is what that really gives me my ultimate hope. Thank you.
once again, thank you, David. Um, you know, the, the knowledge is just flowing and uh, it's, on, it's on display in a variety of ways, of course. Um, so thank you for sharing your evening with us. David has been such a great supporter of what we do at Seward Park Audubon. Uh, he, he's generous with his time and support and his knowledge. So uh, one, more, one more round of applause for him. I think it's appropriate. And, and so, um, you know, we will be back next month with more programs here at the Royal Room. We'll be doing the Big Thaw, which is of talking about the, the melting of the permafrost. But we have um, Molly Hashimoto doing a program with us in Sewer Park. Um, these programs are free, so please check your mail and check, your, uh, check our website to learn more about these. And as we leave, um, uh, Ed Dominguez, who is our lead naturalist, um, he's a person who's always a witness to what's going on. Right now, we're in this period called autumnal recrudescence. And if you're not familiar with that, um, you should listen to what Ed's going to say, and also he's going to put it in a poem. And it's actually a magical time of the year, and it's going to really urge you to keep your eyes and ears open for the next couple of weeks. Ed? Wait, wait, oh, oh, hold a second. Oh! books. We got books. The books are over there. They're $30, including tax. That's a $20 bill and a $10 bill or a credit card. So um, I, think, I think David would actually personalize them for you. And so that'll be a great opportunity for you to kind of put your um, stamp or put his stamp on this wonderful evening. There you go. Thank you, Joey. Thank you, David. Great presentation. And I have hope. Yeah. Well, it's the uh, Seward Park Audubon Royal Room Vocabulary Quiz. How many have heard know the term recrudescence? Oh, yes, some do. Well, you don't get to answer. You, you already know it back there. They're Audubon Washington people. Recrudescence is a term that means the return of something. It's actually a medical term. It's, it's kind of the opposite of remission. If you have something that you're experiencing that's a medical issue and it's in remission, it goes away. If it's rec in recrudescence, it comes back. And naturalists have co-opted that term because we're in, we're in fall now, happy, happy fall 2021, and our day and night are starting to reach the same level of balance as it is in March. And so Autumnal recrudescence is a term that naturalists have kind of taken from the medical field to when birds and plants and animals start acting like it's springtime again. And they think it's March and they start, flowers will start budding and you'll see flowers blooming and blossoming and you think, wait a minute, our hummingbirds have been doing their courtship jay dives at Seward Park. I heard a purple finch giving its, you know, um, its mating call, calling in the females. You start seeing behaviors that are very, very odd. And they'll last through most of October until everybody in the natural world realizes that, wait a minute, it's getting darker and darker and colder and colder. False alarm. <laughs> But it's a real phenomenon. It's cataloged by scientists all over the world, autumnal recrudescence. And in 1973, a woman named Susan Stiles summed it up in a beautiful poem that I'd like to leave you with tonight because it's happening right now, and for the next month or so, keep your eyes and ears open, and you'll see a lot of strange things that make you think, is it really October or is it March? The poem is titled... The autumnal recrudescence of the amatory ooh, urge. When the birds are cacophonic in the trees and on the verge of the fields in mid-October when the cold is like a scourge. It is not delight in winter that makes feathery voices surge, but autumnal recrudescence of the amatory urge. When the frost is on the pumpkin, and when leaf and branch diverge, birds with hormones reawaken, sing a paean, not a dirge. What's the reason for their warbling? Why on earth this late year splurge? Tis autumnal recrudescence of the amatory urge. Susan Stiles, 1973. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy Paul, thank you. Grab those books, everybody, and thank you all for coming out.